Do your hair a favor by checking in online and arriving just in time for your Sport Clips MVP haircut experience. While you surround yourself with sports on TV, fresh cut, massaging shampoo, and hot steam towel. Claim your spot today. Sportclips.com slash check-in. This is the Best of Golic and Wingo Podcast. Good Tuesday, everybody. Welcome in to another edition of Golic and Wingo. Glad you're here with us. We're on ESPN Radio and ESPN News to start today because the Australian Open is going on. If you want to check out the Australian Open, it's finishing up on ESPN2, and then we'll bounce over there once that's uh, done. We are presented by Progressive Insurance. All phone guests join us via the Shell Penzoil Performance Line. Trey Wingo, Mike Golick, and Mike Golick Jr., We've got basketball beef. Yeah, we do. We've got basketball beef to talk about. Listen, this is just going to be a fun show because we're going to be talking about fights. All right? I mean, fights. Well, well let's be honest. No, no, no. no, no. Sort of. We're, we're not. No, no, no. I'm sorry. Yeah. Let me clarify. We're not talking about what went on here because, as you'll hear from, like, Charles Barkley and Shaquille O'Neal, what they think of this in the actual fight. We're going to actually get into actual fights that went on on a field, yes. on a court, you know, maybe get out there, your best fight scene out on a field that actually happened. Because for the most part, we know, and this is around the Clippers and the Rockets game, for those that didn't stay up late enough, uh, the Clippers won the game, but there was the, the beef afterward, which led to a breaching of the locker room. Beef. I was going to say, it's the we were focusing on the wrong B word. Yeah. It's about breaching. Yeah, we had a is. breach last night. We had a carefully calculated, coordinated breach. Well, I, it yeah. seems like there was a two-pronged attack. Somebody go distract them through the front door and yeah. we'll sneak around the flank. There, there's a lot to is, get is into General with this. Schwarzkopf involved here? But, That's what I want to know. The fun of it will be the offshoot of it, which will be other fights that, that have happened uh, maybe to you out there, as I said, on, on the field or on the court or something. So real fight. For the most part, sports fights never happen. Fact. We, we know. And, and I don't care what sport. Unless it's you know? the malice at the palace. Well, exactly. But, for, but the high percentage of athletes squaring off in any sport Rarely does anything happen, and, and and this wasn't even on the court last night. This as we've been talking about, I know Mike, you were talking about it all morning on your show. This one went to the locker room, where of course nothing happened. Secret passages, yeah, yeah. People, I mean, poor it, the guy I feel worse for in all this is Clint Capella. Yeah. We can we can get into that yeah, later, yeah, but yeah, I want to yeah, put yeah. that out there now. Is I feel for Clint Capella, and I hope he gets a chance at redemption. Someday. And of course, most people are saying. Who the heck is Clint Capella? Which we can get into as well. So we'll get into a lot of that, including yeah. including how close it came to an actual throwdown between the Clippers and the Rockets. <laughs> but we'll start this hour, as we tend to do most days, with... It's time for... Off the Top. Whether you like it or not, it's just beginning. With Golik and Wingo. All right, we start off the top with baseball news. The Giants added to their outfield by picking up former NFL MVP Andrew McCutcheon in a trade with the Pirates on Monday. Yeah, his slugging percentage last year would have led the outfield for the Giants, and that's what they were looking for. Last year, home runs at the Giants' outfield was last. Slugging percentage, they were last. Uh, batting average, they were 23rd. They are getting a little older, though. McCutcheon, yep. uh, they got Evan Longoria as well, 32-year-old Longoria, 31-year-old Andrew McCutcheon. Uh, so it's kind of an older Giants team, but you got to give them credit. They, they saw their weaknesses and they grab are grabbing players that they think will fill those needs. Now, both these players last year to, toward the end of the season started to wear down a little bit. So you have that issue as well, possibly. Yeah, you did. And for Pittsburgh right now, sort of a fire sale for them. Lost Cole the other day before this going over to the Houston Astros and bolstering that World Series roster. And now to lose McCutcheon, a guy who's been probably the face of that franchise for the most recent history in that city. It's a, it's a weird time for them as they face year in and year out the prospect of Ben Roethlisberger's retirement seeing that changing of the guard happen over at PNC right now has got to be an interesting feeling in the city interesting is certainly one way to describe yeah. how people in Pittsburgh yeah. might feel about those moves but to your point about a 32 year old uh, Longoria and a 31 year old McCutcheon eight of the nine players top nine players in the Giants last season in terms of uh, what they were were, were were 29 or older yeah you know and only Joe Panic uh, was under the age of the second baseman was under the age of 29 so they may be getting a little better, but they are certainly becoming a veteran squad. They better win quick. Yeah, I was about to say, <laughs> window small yeah. for the San Francisco Giants. But uh, again, they're making moves to yep. try and bolster their roster. 
off the top. We go from the San Francisco Giants to the New York football Giants. Planning to schedule a second interview with Minnesota's offensive coordinator Pat Shermer next week, according to our Dan Graziano and Chris Mortensen. See, again, these guys, uh, these teams have to wait. You know, we're talking about Josh McDaniels, Matt uh, Patricia, Matt Patricia, uh, Pat Shermer. All these guys are coaching right now. So you're going to have to wait till the, the week in between if the, of the coaches that would be playing in between the AFC NFC championship games and, uh, the Super Bowl. But you look at the openings right now. A lot of people thought Shermer was going to end up with the Arizona Cardinals, and wherever he goes, is he going to take Case Keenan with him? I don't know if that would happen if he'd go to the Giants with Eli Manning there. You may want to draft younger, uh, and then you still have Matt Patricia, the thought, uh, in Detroit. You have Josh McDaniels, the thought, in uh, Indianapolis. Mike Vrabel actually getting some talk uh, for for the Tennessee job. And then again, if Shermer ends up with the Giants and there's Arizona still wondering what's going to happen out there because Shermer was rumored there as well. So still a few dominoes to fall. Yeah, interesting. A lot of people will point to certainly with Pat Shermer, the job he's done with Case Keenum this season, but even as the interim coordinator last year, what they were able to do with Sam Bradford behind an offensive line that was basically Swiss cheese for most of the year that tried to get that quarterback killed, adjusting and keeping everything tight to the line, (laughs) a high completion percentage for him, that job as much as anything else in keeping them into it was as masterful as anything. So between that, and the Vrabel, the Tennessee one is interesting. For yeah, as is. much play as it's been around Mike Malarkey and that staff not developing Marcus Mariota, they've turned to the offensive-minded Mike Vrabel, who, lest we not forget, was basically an automatic touchdown every time he took the field as an offensive player <laughs> for the Patriots. <laughs> there you go. No. That's that inside thinking. No, right no, there. he's exactly right. Mike Vrabel has the greatest line in the history of he the does. NFL. Uh, I believe in his career he has 12 receptions for 12 touchdowns. Yeah. So, and two of them in Super Bowl. So it was in the pudding for a linebacker. Why wouldn't you not? Now you're getting a defensive coach and an offensive coach. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> every, every player should have Mike Vrabel. How stats. about that? Oh, twelve horrible. catches for twelve touchdowns. Two of them in the Super Bowl. He's a linebacker. You go, Vrabes. You go. Off the top. Comebacks. The theme of the day in college basketball as Duke, Kansas, and Michigan all rallied from double digits to win for Duke. Marvin Bagley the third had his. 15th double-double of the season, breaking the record for the most in a season by a Duke freshman. Yeah, that was a tie with Jabari, Jabari Parker did it in 2013. Then you go back to 1977, Gene Banks as well. But you mentioned the comebacks. That's what we're going. Don't they were call tra- it a comeback. They were trailing 66-53 with 7.59 left. They ended the game on a 30-9 to run. So 5 Duke beats 25 Miami. Number 10 Kansas trailed by as many as 16 points. Before they rallied and they beat number six West Virginia, first sixteen uh, point comeback since March third, two thousand fifteen, for them. And number three twenty, uh, number twenty three Michigan trailed by as many as fourteen points. They win on a couple of last second uh, free throws. They beat Maryland sixty eight sixty seven. So gotta love that big big time comeback, double digit comebacks for all these teams. Yeah, big time uh, early here, and Marvin Bagley continues to oh cement himself as one of the top players in college basketball. I think they got something like five points out of Grayson Allen last night too. So not a lot of production from there or their bench, and Marvin Bagley putting the team on his back in a big moment that tends to bode well as you start to stack those up, all understanding that this is building towards tournament time. Grayson Allen had a couple of hustle steals uh, to go on in that game. You know, if you're not scoring, there's other things sometimes that don't show up. A steal does, but how you get it, a diving steal right at the end of the half. And I believe they said there were 37 NBA scouts at that game last night. Well, that would uh, be a substantial number. Yeah, I mean, Ma- yeah, Grayson's going to be a lottery pick. Yeah. <laughs> Marvin Bagley All is right. just unbelievable, and you stop it. Yeah. He's very good, uh, but the kid from Oklahoma is ridiculous. Trey Young is absolutely insane. Yeah, he's not going ahead of Marvin Bagley, though. We'll see. Oh, there's no shot. We'll see. No Ooh. shot. No, I'm just on Team Trey. I know, yeah, you should yeah, know. I know you. I, that's very true. Thank My you. bad. Yeah. You could, we continue. Off the top. As the Cavaliers continue to struggle, the Warriors rally from seven down at half to beat the Cavs and sweep the season series. The Warriors are ten and two since Christmas, while the Cavs are two and eight. Mike. Yeah, you know, and you look at the again; it's the offensive side of it. Uh, we, we always know the Cavaliers. We talked about last year how they struggled defensively, and then they flipped the switch and, and played better in the playoffs. But since Christmas, uh, the Cavaliers are two and eight defensive efficiency. We understand at, at you know being right at, la- at last, but offensively they're twenty fourth. 
So, so Isaiah wait, Ta- wait, so they have no they have bad defense and not really. As good I on said, offense? it was like my NFL career. I was I was weak, but I made up for it by being slow. <laughs> uh, you know that's it. And right now they're not making up for it. Well, Isaiah Thomas did score better. He had nineteen. It was eight at twenty one shooting, but he did have nineteen horrible from three point land. One of seven, but you know it was a tale of two halves. Cavs were up seven uh, at halftime, and they lost by ten. So they obviously got outscored by seventeen. Uh, in the second half, 61 to 44. It was right around that five minute mark of the third quarter. I think it was Steph Curry that hit that three to put him up. I think it was 82 81, and they just started to move on from there and, and make it a pretty comfortable win. Yeah, this is one of those games where I look at it and go, I didn't really learn anything that I didn't already know. And we're going to hear all the overreaction in the world about how the Cavs won't make it out of the Eastern Conference now, and I don't care. I've seen this before. Yeah, yeah. I know who the January Cavs are. I know the Warriors are still better than everyone else. We all just probably need to chill on this one. Let's just hit February when the Cavs will start to play basketball again. Do you not realize what we're going to do after the football season is over on this show? We're going to talk about the Cavs and their concerns a lot. Yes, we are. So, so you just understand. You, you hold to that belief, young man, because some of us will be talking about that from February 5th to April 10th. We'll be talking about breaches, Trey, because I have a feeling we're oh going, that's going to be a trend and not a blip. In, in fact, we're going to be talking about it so much. We're going to have Dave McMenamin, our Cavs reporter, coming up at 8 o'clock right here on Golik and Wingo. We'll also have Bill Poley and our front office insider. We'll have Chris Canty from ESPN New York 98.7 FM to talk about what's going on with the Giants. And, of course, he's someone that knows what it takes to beat the New England Patriots. We'll see if he thinks the Jacksonville Jaguars can do that. Lewis Riddick will join us as well in the 9 o'clock hour. And because it was one of the greatest calls of all time, not really, Pete Bursich, uh, the, the color commentator on the Vikings uh, play-by-play team on radio will join us because he sort of was screaming in the great. background <laughs> great. of Paul Allen's call of the great touchdown pass from Case Keenum to Stephon Diggs, and we'll try and have him sort of discern what he was trying to say during that was, awesome. was, was sort of his reaction to that game-winning touchdown pass. We'll get into all of that, but as we said before we delved into off the top, we've got basketball beef to discuss. Okay, here's what happened. Houston's James Harden, Chris Paul, Trevor Reza, and Gerald Green tried to push their way into the Clippers' locker room Monday looking for a confrontation with Austin Rivers after the Rockets' 113-102 loss. League sources tell our Adrian Wojnarowski security escorted the Rocket players out before anything turned physical, though. They had entered through a back hallway that connects the dressing room. The Rocket players were clamoring for Blake Griffin, according to sources. They were upset, Mike. Yeah, I mean... They were angry. <laughs> this was a game that Blake Griffin got tossed from. He had two technicals toward the end of the game, one with Ariza. The other, supposedly, he elbowed Mike D'Antoni. That's what D'Antoni said. So Chris Paul said, I got my coaches back. Uh, the I know a lot of the Rockets were a little ticked off at Austin Rivers. He wasn't even playing in the game, by the way. He was in his suit and just yapping on the sideline like I guess he does and really aggravated a lot of them. So the the key thing here, and I know, Mike, you were talking a, t- a ton about it this morning, is remember, Chris Paul played for this team, so he knew another way into the locker room. Another way, while Clint Capella, the 6'10", you know, big dude, was banging on the front door, you know, what was he sent to distract them at the front door? Uh, uh, it was Chris Paul leading his group through a, a back entrance into the locker room for a confrontation where, of course, absolutely nothing happened. So this is interesting to me on a number of fronts. As I have mentioned, I want to get out ahead of this. I feel bad for Clint Capella because he learned what his friends thought about him, and it wasn't very good. Clint Capella was the distraction. He's they, the rocket center. They say, yeah, they, they sent him to the front door, and they said, you go knock over there and just you know see see what they're doing. We'll go through the back and take care of this. And I'm sure there's part of him that's listening as this plan is laid out going, wait a minute, I don't get to be there for the pseudo-fisticuffs. What the hell? And so now you've got a guy who probably fancies himself a big, bruising guy, hey, 6'10", 6, 10, 240, yeah, yeah. all of a sudden realizing his friends don't really count on him to be there when it's going down. That's got to be a sad feeling. Yeah. Well, the other thing, <laughs> 6'10", 240, I mean, like Ben's, Ben Roethlisberger is 6'5", 260. So 6'10", 240 doesn't sound as big and brooding as we might think it could be. Solid reach, though, like yeah. if you're looking Wings naturally. From, yeah. And by the way, Capella's having a pretty decent season, so... But the, uh, when you when you hear six ten and then two forty, 
Doesn't seem that intimidating. No, it probably. I don't know. I was six ten. I was say six four, ten. Six, we're all looking up at that, and then a reach. We we'd never get within two feet of the guy if, if he was a good puncher and could keep us at distance. I, well, I don't know. I think you're selling short six ten. No, no, I'm, I'm just saying. I mean, to me, six ten like two eighty sounds much. I mean, okay. I mean, we, ben we, Roethlisberger is six five two sixty. Okay, that's yeah, that didn't run a quarterback sneak. Well, yeah. Then, well, but he could have. He said, according to him, he could have. They just I, didn't do it. I don't know. I don't know if Clint Capella's two six two forty is made up with as much PF Chang's as Ben Roethlisberger's two sixty is. But I, but I, I, I had a quarterback seat with Clint Capella. That's for sure. Yes, just fall that, forward. That's an automatic first down. Yeah, exactly. Okay, so back to the basketball yeah. beef. We told uh, we told you that Woj was there. Here's what he had to say about exactly what happened after the game. Uh, four Clipper, pl- or four Rockets players: uh, James Harden, Chris Paul. Gerald Green and Trevor Ariza uh, literally breached the Clippers locker room, went through a back hallway that connects the Rockets locker room with the Clippers, got into the room. They were calling for Austin Rivers, Blake Griffin. Uh, Security got to them uh, before there was any contact. The Clipper players saw them come in, I was told. They jumped up to their feet, uh, but there was no physical confrontation. And while that was going on, uh, Rocket Center, Clint Capella was knocking on the front door of the locker room. Uh, he was not let in. Wow. The best wow. part is he was not let in. Here's probably the, the and you, you, you said it before the show started. Oh, it's yeah, right go there. ahead. I'll let no, you do No, no, you go ahead and take it. It's good. This from, uh, one Clipper witness. Witness. Oh, I, I love this. Like there was, it was just it was a crime Tell scene. Tell me what happened. Let's tape off the locker room. Let's bring in the investigators. <laughs> one Clipper witness told ESPN it was classic NBA. None of these guys were going to fight. Hold me back. Hold me back. And, and there it is right there. There, there it is right there is. And, and I don't, I don't know these guys, but, but given their druthers of if they could, would they? That would be the, the thing. Now, you have to be smart on a court because you have to know where you are and know what can happen to you if you actually throw a punch. I mean, you're automatically going to be gone and yes. then you could be suspended and fine. So I'm not going to rip people on a court for not squaring off, you know, and, and throwing punches. You know, d- depending on the melee and all that, but because you, you have to understand the situation. So I don't know these guys, uh, but but we just had the situation. What was it with Toronto and Philadelphia? Kyle, Kyle Lowry and, and Ben Simmons, Simmons saying, "Let's yeah. go meet in the concourse." Here's what I would like, and this happened to me in Philly when uh, I was playing uh, for Buddy Ryan, and we fought all the time, all the time in practice. Absolutely, but, but you what you did. find out then is you don't get a lot accomplished when and I when I say fights, I mean. Two guys would start fighting and then everybody would jump in, right? So, and, and at some point you just don't get anything accomplished and coaches hate the fight, fights right now. So at one point there was a new edict out there. If a fight starts, the two people that start the fight, they're the only ones allowed to fight. Anybody who jumps in, you're going to run till you puke and nobody wants to run. So that curtails the fights because now it's just the two of you. You have to fight. And oh, by the way, in football practice, after you're done fighting, what do you got to do? You got to go back and practice and you're dead tired. So that's what I would like to see is two guys square off and everybody just say, okay, go ahead, go ahead, go fight. And, and see if they would really fight. Exactly, because then you learn who's really willing yes. to expend all that energy yes. and who can actually. Because there's a there's who a difference. Practice hard enough, apparently. Yeah. <laughs> exactly, because that one. I mean, there's a difference. There's also knowing to your point, because we see all this taking place off the court. It's knowing who's actually really willing to go that extra mile. Exactly I remember in right. Hard Knocks a couple of years ago, Mike Pouncey said it best because there was in the middle of a play and him and Richie Incognito had just dump truck some guy and he got up and like he was going to do something and Mike said he's like, "This is fine if you want to do this now, but." I'm I'm going to make you fight me in the locker room after if you really want to do this. And it's amazing how quickly most people will bow out. Because I always said, you got to know who's actually crazy. And that, to me, perception in this seems to be the biggest culprit. Because what makes you mad enough to go and storm another person's yeah. locker room? Breach. It's belie- Not just storm. Breach. 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 We breached that locker room. Breach. But it's the belief that Austin Rivers and Blake Griffin shouldn't be the guys talking to you. So yeah. what's that say about the way everyone perceives them? Well, speaking of perception, people <laughs> are wondering why we had this perception of nothing was actually going to happen. If you don't believe oh, us, oh. let's just take a listen to how the TNT crew broke down this after they learned what had happened. Enjoy. Are you kidding me? Yeah. Uh, wait, <laughs> come on, man. Numerous social media reports that, that LAPD was called. LAPD was called. <laughs> See, these two, man. Come on, man. Come on, man. Because they, they, 
They would party. Oh, party. Okay, so that was that was Kenny Smith, Ernie Johnson, Shaq, and Barkley, and they were having yeah, no you, part that this was actually going to go down. You gotta you gotta see this. You you, you gotta you can't can't show it to you. You can only play the audio. You have to see Barkley and Shaq. Just howling, doubled over, in howling. Oh, I thought that was Ernie. At how funny the, as Ernie's trying to say, "Wait a minute, hey, the this police is a big were deal. called." And, and I mean, these two, Shaq threw his papers at one point. Let's but, hit but, it again. Uh, Are you kidding me? Uh, uh, <laughs> wait, come on, man. Numerous social media reports that that LAPD wait for was it. called. LAPD was called. <laughs> These two, man, oh, man. Oh, man. because they 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 would oh, man. take me See, seriously. So take I mean, me seriously. Th- th- that's what I'd like to know. So you you breach the locker room. Then that, then that, I said it would have been great. Oh. I, I'd have been like okay. You know, I I can see I have some great fight stories. This is gonna be a fun show for me. So oh, I have yeah. really good fight stories. So, but then you go in there and me you basically too. say, e- I'm sure you do. Yeah. Everybody, everybody would just say, okay, Chris Paul, you got a problem with Austin Rivers? Go and, and see what they would have done. That's what I want to. What? And I don't know. Maybe they would have fought. I have no idea. But that's what you want to see because everybody st- can storm in with a group. But man, who's going to do that first thing? Who's going to make that first move other than, you know, just kind of hold me cussing, back. cussing hold me at back. one another? Hold me yeah. back. Yeah. And, and like you've always, like you've always said, and like you will point out with the guys that you knew in your locker room, you know, everyone yes, in there do. knows the guys that yep. are willing to. So we might not know from the outside looking in. I guarantee everyone in that locker room knew who, if push came to shove, was actually going to throw one because everyone yep. can identify right. that guy. Yeah. That is a well documented right. fact. And, and to that point, if you were going to breach another person's locker room and going to start fisticuffs in the NBA, let's put it out there on Golik and Wingo on the Twitter feed. Who would you want leading that fight? Yeah, Who yeah. would you want the point man on that? I All-time NBA players, pick anybody. I have a couple of guys that I would go to right away, and it wouldn't be close. Golik and Wingo, the podcast. Mm-hmm. Trey Wingo and Mike Golik Sr. We're talking a lot about the, uh, the pseudo-fight. The yeah. fight that wasn't. The intentional anger that sort of was put to the back burner when some of the Clippers uh, were under the impression that Chris Paul, the former Clipper, and a couple of Rockets wanted to go in there and have a piece of them Yeah, after uh, after a little physical confrontation uh, in the Clippers' win over the Rockets uh, last night. And it, it got us to talking about some of the great fights. You, your Eagles team must oh. have had a million fights. Well, I'm, I'm going to get into, the, the, the at, at one point, the... Um the uh, training camp fight that we had amongst the O line and the D line, it was like it was like the Sharks and the Jets. Uh, oh, it was, was, uh, there, was there was there there was dancing and a uh, musical score. The, well, uh, this is amazing. There was something that happened. I've told this story a, a bunch during uh, when I was doing Mike and Mike. So people, some people will will recognize the story. Others, it, it, yeah, there was a, a a part of that <laughs> fight that was. Very, very interesting. Right now, you sound like Everson Griffin trying to explain the last play of the Vikings game. So. I don't know how to explain it. But you know, as far as fights, so so every or most everyone, I don't know, Trey, have you ever been in a fight? I have. Okay, Mike, have you ever been in, in, in a fight? Like a non-sport. Oh, boy. like a non-unbelievable. Not yet. Just unbelievable. All right, like so a, anyway, getting back to what we were talking about. Like a about. non-sports fight? Yeah. No. You haven't. No. So you're, I, I, so those that have, and, and I'm going to get into sports fight there, but there was, as far as the group mentality, uh, once you get together, if you get, if it ends up going one on one, what do you do? We were at a, 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 a picnic at a large place. And I think my brother Bob was like 14 or 15, but he was always big for his size, right? So he was hanging out somewhere and there was a group of like 17, 18, 19 year olds and they, you know, Wanted to pick on this younger kid. So they started picking on him and, and they're doing stuff to Bob. So Bob's kind of firing stuff back at, you know, I don't know, acorns or something there where they, where they start chasing my brother Bob, right? An and my acorn bro- fight. But yeah, exactly. But you know, at that age. Yeah. So my brother Bob takes off and he sees my dad who's, who's cooking on the grill. And so my brother Bob thinks, Oh, I'm safe, right? So he gets to my dad and he goes behind my dad and all the, all the kids come up and, and my dad looks at all the guys and he looks at Bob and Bob says, what's going on? I said, these guys, you don't want to fight me. And my dad looks at the, at the group of guys and they're like, what's up? And they said, we're going to kick your son's butt. And my dad said, you are. Okay. He said, all right. He said, how old are you? And he went, there's about four or five of them. And the ones who's like 19, 18 and two of them said they were 17. 
And my dad said, okay, 18 and 9 year old you guys are too old. You guys back off. you 17-year-olds, one at a time, he'll fight you. And my brother Bob looked up at my dad like, what the hell are you doing? I thought I was safe behind you, you know, and, and here you're telling me to fight. But he told the, the two 17-year-olds, one at a time, whoever wants to be first, step up, and he'll fight you. And they're like, no, 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 we're going to. my dad said, no, 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 yeah. you can fight him, yeah. but you're going to do it one-on-one. Yeah. That's how you're going to fight him. None of them wanted to do there it. There you go. I mean, so it, that's when, awesome. Actually, all of a sudden, when it gets called out, when you actually have to get to that point, who has that look in their eye? Who who will make that move to actually fight? Well, and, and so the, the the premise we put out there on on our Twitter feed, Golik and Wingo, who would you want leading an NBA fight? And we've got some tweets. We'll read some of those uh, in a little bit. But there's only one guy. There's if 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 you really want to have an NBA throwdown. <laughs> There's only one guy in the history of the league that matters, and everybody else. It's like Larry Bird when he showed up at the NBA All Star Game and said, "Who's at the three point contest? Who's who's going for second? Because this is the one guy who would win at all time, and that's the pride of Virginia Union, yeah. Charles, Charles Oakley. Oakley. Yeah. You go back, YouTube Charles Oakley fights, and look at all the fights he started, or more importantly, finished in the NBA. <laughs> Nobody was going to play with Charles Oakley. So if you really want to breach somebody's locker room, if you really want to have a throwdown, just get the pride of Virginia Union, and you could have three backup point guards behind him, and you would still win. 6'8", about 240, 250, but he had shoulders on him. He was an imposing sight. And to your point, Mike, because you are a 1,000% correct in players know who those guys are, if he breached the back door and came in the locker room, the people in the locker room would be going, Okay. Yeah. All right. Th- this just got real really quick because it's Charles Oakley. Yeah. We're ac- we're actually going to have to fight this yeah, guy. Yeah. 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 It's exactly and, and, right. And at that point, you'd be like, truce. Yeah. Uh, my bad. Hey, about that. On me. I mean, there there are other people like you know you could do look at the, some of the participants in the malice in the palace. Right. Right. Ron Artest, Stephen Jackson, who was uh, working for us now and is yeah. always more than happy. Boy, I would love to get Stephen yeah. Jackson to talk about Charles Oakley though. Oakley was on a different. Level. He fought Barkley once in a preseason game. In an NBA preseason I'm game. trying to think of the players of today who, who might be that guy. Cause you don't, you don't see a lot of fights like you did then. It's just a different game. I'm not sitting here casting aspersions saying one's better, one's worse. It was much it more was, physical. It was just a different game. Totally where, different Where that NBA stuff game. was, was allowed a little more and it led to some of those fisticuffs. And, uh, today you just don't have that kind of physicality in the well, game. Yeah. We don't have that kind of physicality because we as a public are not able to handle that anymore without misusing <laughs> it and judging it the wrong way. Yeah. Because the minute NBA players got into a fight, you would start throwing the thug word around and everything yep. would start yep. to get to a really negative connotation. So we've proven that we can't handle that as a general public. So we don't get it anymore. That being said, I feel like remnant of a bygone era, Zach Randolph would probably be a guy that's willing to go out there. Any guy that's got a flip phone in 2018 <laughs> probably is going to be a candidate for this. So Jerry Jones would then be a... Oh, Jerry, no, I, listen, listen, Jerry Jones, I, he's I, listen, I, I don't know the things Jerry's done. <laughs> Uh, 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 that's probably a good thing. That's probably uh, that we don't know. We don't know. We're just sort of speculating and having having a, a quick laugh here. But no, it's it's Charles Oakley and everybody else. Right? It doesn't matter. I'm sure others will come Charles up with Oakley. more. People are going in other sports as well, and this is the fun of it. I mean, if you could pick, that would be it. If you could pick one guy, one guy in football, basketball, baseball. <laughs> Hockey. I yeah. mean, there's another well, one there. Now, hockey's great. I, I mean, mean you're kidding me. You could probably go more than a few there. I mean, there. If, you, if you think about it, there's a guy on every team in the NHL whose job is specifically yeah. to fight. Yeah. Okay. There's one guy on every team. That's his job. So that would be different. But if we're talking the NBA, I mean, just, just YouTube Charles Oakley. I mean, Dennis Rodman tried him. Uh, you know, Alonzo Mourning tried him. Barkley tried him a couple of times. Yeah. And I, I'll take Barkley, too, because Barkley, you know, junkyard dog. I, I, he yeah. would go there as well. Give me the two chucks, and you can have whoever you I, want. I don't know where you could go other than Oakley. I mean, yeah. I, I'm sure people will, will chime in with some things, but that was more from our era, certainly not your era, Mike, of, of watching basketball and just and again it was completely different then so it's a little more difficult to know today but it's always fun whenever you see a baseball fight or whenever you see groups going at one another you just basically know rarely if anything is ever going to happen well, and now that you open up to all other sports like that the one person i really want to give their proper due here is andre johnson who absolutely wore Cortland finnegan out oh, remember in that. a very one-on-one public stage on that yeah but uh, 
I mean, first of all, Andre's a great receiver, but that was the one like time he had that. I mean, he was one of the quietest, most reserved guys in the NFL. Had to let I mean, people know. That was like A.J. Green this year on Jalen Ramsey. I mean, A.J. Green's a juggler, right. for crying out loud. Right. He just lost it because uh, Jalen not only is a very good player, and we'll get into some things uh, he's saying about the AFC Championship game and beyond in just a little bit, but like Finnegan, he was an instigator. He wanted to get he, he wants to get under your skin. One football player? Do yeah. you have one off the top of your head? Well, Romanowski comes to mind. Ro- you, Romo is a little, uh, little you, you, know, you know who I may go with? Who? Jack Lambert. Oh, yeah. That's also true. You know, go ask Cliff Harris, the former Cowboy safety. <laughs> Super Bowl X, uh, Roy Jarella misses a kick, and Cliff Harris is patting him on the back saying, hey, thanks for Jack Lambert comes up and tosses Cliff Jack, Harris about five Jack yards Lambert downfield. Jack Lambert was, was scary. Oh, yeah. He had the, the crazy look in his eye all the time. Yeah. All the time. Another one from Pittsburgh, you know, guy, James Harrison. Obviously James, he would be. James Harrison certainly up there. A personal memory for me. Bryant Young, the old uh, defensive tackle right. for the Niners. He was a GA at Notre Dame when I was there and a fight broke out between two players on our team at the time. He was the D-line GA and it went a little too far and it was, you know, between like our ones versus ones in practice and he didn't like it and we were over on the sideline watching this at the time. I was in the second group. We were over on the sideline watching. And you see B.Y. tearing through a crowd. And literally, bodies are flying out of his wake. And it took six coaches to hold him back because he was so incensed at the idea of what was going on. That was the most scared I had seen most of my teammates ever because they very quickly realized that no one was going to stop him if he wanted to keep yeah. going. We well, just got lucky that he decided it was over. When that guy and that guy's fuse gets lit, everybody else is like, uh-oh, okay, we need to stay out of the way. Well, I got one that you and I have worked with here at ESPN. Brian Cox. Oh yeah, I was Brian, a teammate of his in, Brian, in Miami. Brian yeah. Cox. Yeah. He he he's yeah, not quick fuse. He's he's also not having some subterfuge like Capella you go for he'll go I'll go through the front door yeah. and I'll go through the back door yeah. and you'll know that I'm coming from both sides yeah. and you'll know that I was there. Yeah. I mean Brian Cox yeah. was as True. good as it gets when you come to that stuff. Keep those coming in on the Twitter feed. You can t- uh, you can keep it to the NBA if you want to have somebody there, but if you have somebody in other sports that you you want to be behind that guy, I've got your back, Brian Cox. Golick and Wingo, the podcast. What a day, what a show, what a time. Uh, I tell you what, a great sports night last night, yeah. no doubt about it. One, two, three, four. Hey everyone, Mike Golick here. Support for the Golick Wingo podcast comes from our friends at Rocket Mortgage by Quicken Loans. Chances are you're confident when it comes to your work, your hobbies, your life. Rocket Mortgage gives you that same level of confidence when it comes to buying a home or refinancing your existing home loan. With Rocket Mortgage, you can apply simply and understand fully so you can mortgage confidently. To get started, go to rocketmortgage.com slash mics. Equal housing lender, licensed in all 50 states, nmlsconsumeraccess.org number 3030. I'm a robot vacuum cleaner, so yeah, I got one gig. I suck up dirt, so pardon my inferiority complex about GEICO, who does so much more. Like, not only could they save their customers money on car insurance, but they got fast and friendly claim service, too, and an award-winning mobile app. Plus access to licensed agents 24-7. Who am I kidding? I can't even do corners. Uh Uh-oh. Choking hazard. (gasps) Popcorn girdles. Geico. Expect great savings and a whole lot more. Let's start uh, right now with a little what's trending. All right, we talked about the uh, AFC Championship game Mm -hmm. a little bit. It's going to be Jacksonville uh, going up to New England. Now, Jacksonville got past the Steelers. Second time in this uh, in this regular postseason that they've gone into Pittsburgh and won, and some people think part of that might have been not taking anything away from Jacksonville, but it sure seemed like that the the Steelers were chirping a lot about their right. next round matchup with the Patriots. I mean, Mike Mitchell before the game, the safety said, "Hey, we'll play the Steeler uh, the Patriots anywhere. Hell, Haiti, Foxborough, will beat them." Le'Veon Bell went out there and said, I love round twos. We have two round twos coming up. And, of course, they never got to the second round two because they didn't get past the first round two, which would have been the Jacksonville Jaguars. So, there, you know, there were some people that thought, hey, Jacksonville did what they had to do. They beat them twice. Right. So, that clearly, they're the better team in this matchup this year. But some people thought Pittsburgh contributed to that by not focusing solely on the Jags and thinking about the next matchup against New England. Uh, and then they had a celebration at Everbank, uh, field, Everbank Stadium in Jacksonville after the team came home from the win in Pittsburgh. And Jalen Ramsey, uh, had this to say. I ain't got too much to say. 
But y'all make sure y'all bring that same energy out here next week and the week after. We going to the Super Bowl and we going to win that. We going to win that. Okay. Now, in the, in the, <clears throat> along the lines of Animal House. Yeah. And, and, uh, John Belushi talking about, you know, when the Germans bombed Pearl Harbor and you kind of said, Hey, should we let him know? No, he's no, on no, a roll. He's on a roll. Yeah. When Jalen said this weekend, next week, yeah. did anybody need to tap him and say, hey, do we oh, let him oh, know oh. there's a week in between the games? Yeah. It won't be this weekend. No, no, no. He's on a roll. Are they going to win the Pro Bowl? Yeah. So they're going <laughs> to they're gonna, they're gonna beat the Patriots. They're going to storm the Pro Bowl, and then they're winning the Super and, Bowl. And what's a line you think you'd never hear from Jalen Ramsey? Yeah. What was his first line? I don't have a lot to say. And then he had a lot to say. Yeah, he always <laughs> has. And, and, I mean, he is part of a defense that is fun to watch. He is a great player. Listen, I picked New England, we're, and we're going to get into breaking these games down, obviously, during the week. I picked New England to go make it to the Super Bowl, so I'm probably going to stay with that this week. But, boy, I tell you what, this defense. Now, this defense did just give up a lot of points to Pittsburgh, yep. and they're going up against New England, who in the regular season was second only to the Rams uh, in scoring points. But the way to beat Brady is to hit him and move him, and this defense Especially this defensive line can do it. I am, I am looking forward to breaking this game down this week. And Ramsey certainly has some confidence. And it's brought to you by National Mortgage Lender Quicken Loans. Apply simply, understand fully, mortgage confidently. Then again, Jalen does everything confidently. Yes, he does. Uh, we continue with what's trending. The San Francisco Giants added to their outfield by picking up former NFL MVP Andrew McCutcheon in a trade with the Pirates on Monday. You know, you look at their outfield last season, they were last in home runs, last in slugging percentage, third in batting average, so, you know, they weren't doing very well there. But they brought in certainly some age. Evan Longoria, 32 years old, and now Andrew McCutcheon, whose who's slugging percentage would have led uh, that outfield last year. He's 31 years old. They have an older team, so they're they're kind of lacing it up for right now. Both those guys kind of tailed off at the end of the year. You know, when you get up there at age, that certainly can't happen. So we'll see how they go through the year. The bottom line is do enough to make it to the postseason and then see what you can do. But you can't say they're not going after it. Even though it is with older players, they are going for it. And when when you're bringing in older players, that means you're trying to get the job done right right now. You're not building really for the future at this point. No, you're not. Uh, And again... To that point, uh, you know, only Joe Panic, their second baseman yeah. of all their top plate appearance guys mm-hmm. last year, was uh, under the age of twenty nine. Yeah. So they're they're a veteran group, uh, no question about it. And then Mike, mm-hmm. there's this. This is important. We have a new sports power couple. Yeah, we do. Bears fan, Bears fan, mm-hmm. car driver Danica Patrick yep. confirmed to the Associated Press that she is now dating. Packers quarterback Aaron Rodgers. Okay, power couple, power couple alert. Uh, Allie's going to put this up on the poll. Again, keep the, your people coming on who you think you would want to go into the locker room with, uh, you know, if there was a, a fight that would go on. Who would you follow in the locker room? But let's, let's rank power couples, shall we? Power couples out there. Now, the, the key about this power couple is at least one has to be involved in sports. Okay. Yes. Or basically, Jay Z and Beyonce would be tough to beat, would they not? That would be a that tough would be, one to get. That would be around. a tough one to beat. So power couples where at least one person has to be involved in sports. I would think we're going to put up for the choice has got to be J Lo and A Rod. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Got to be Tom Brady and Giselle. Absolutely. Okay. Let's put Aaron Rodgers and Danica. Mm-hmm. We we're trying to think of a fourth one that we thought we came up with: Gabby, Gabby Union and Dwayne Wade. And Dwayne Wade. Yeah, Gabriel solid. Union, Dwayne Wade. If we want to put that up there, I don't think they're going to place in this thing. They're so up there. we're going to we're going to put those choices up for you. They're actually or, not in last place right now. Oh, they're not. Yeah. Okay, or you can write in your own. I, I'd like to see who people think it would be a power couple that would be up to that grouping right now. But Danica Patrick, who's going away from driving, yeah. she's retiring from driving. She's going to you know keep building that brand. And as you mentioned, Bears fan, though she said she'll probably she would always root. She met Aaron Rodgers in the 2012 ESPYS. She's always liked him. ESPYS bringing people and together. There you go. And she always rooted for him, but obviously not the Packers. Now she said, I'll probably root for the whole team. And then she said, no, 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 take out probably. I will. So uh, by dating, we got her to leave her team that she rooted wow. for in the Chicago Bears. You know, that, that, what's the fandom there then? Right? Yeah. How deep is the How fandom? Di- well, How deep is the fandom there? Love of person beats love of team, I, I guess. Know. I don't know. I know. That's I, a tough one. I bet there would be a lot of true fans who would say, can't do it. I agree. You can go ahead and date the guy. Yeah. Doesn't mean you have to stop rooting for your team. Yeah, you can say, hey, I wish you well, right. but this is my team right. forever and ever. By exactly the way, right. uh, just so people understand, the rivalry, it's the oldest rivalry in the NFL, Packers-Bears. Right. This is the way the Chicago Tribune 
announce this couple. You ready? Racing driver and Bears fan Danica Patrick confirms she's dating Bachelorette winner's brother. They wouldn't, no. They, they wouldn't even say Aaron Rodgers' no name. No way. They have a picture of Aaron with Danica, but the headline says she's dating Bachelorette winner's brother. Wow. And remember, this is Aaron Rodgers coming off dating Olivia Munn yes. for a while, and, yeah. and they broke up. And now, so that that's the choices. Aaron and Danica, A-Rod, J-Lo, Brady and Giselle, Dwayne Wade, Gabrielle Union. Okay. So uh, those are... Those are the four choices. If you want to, again, throw a different one in there, go ahead. But that's that's the vote we have at Golik and Wingo. Okay, so so we'll keep that going throughout the show because, mm-hmm. quite frankly, you can't talk about fights and power couples enough. No. But there's something else that's going on right now, Mike, that needs to be addressed. Mm-hmm. And it needs to be addressed swiftly. Okay. Uh, there's a notion out there uh, in a couple of places, because of what we're seeing in the NFL right now, that the idea of having an elite quarterback – a franchise quarterback, is no longer necessary. Mm-hmm. And the premise is, well, look at the four teams in the conference championships. You have Tom Brady, maybe yeah. the greatest quarterback the that's ever played. Right. And then you have, well, Nick Foles is leading the Philadelphia Eagles. And Case Keenum has found some way with the Minnesota Vikings. And, of course, we have Blake Bortles there with the things that he has struggled right. with throughout his career. And the notion is that, hey – Maybe now you don't need a franchise quarterback to be successful in the NFL. Here's what our friend Stephen A. Smith had to say in his radio show about this. What really made me sick to my stomach is the fact that Drew Brees is not going to be in the Super Bowl. Because, ladies and gentlemen, without him in the Super Bowl, you know what I have as a choice out of the NFC? Case Keenum or Nick Foles. Really? I mean, really? Why why don't y'all just ask people to skip the Super Bowl? I mean... Ladies and gentlemen, I don't know if anybody's realized this, but you talk about Tom Brady holding the NFL in the palm of his hands. Could you imagine if the Super Bowl is Blake Bortles versus Nick Foles or Case Keenum? You talk, you talk about ratings plummeting. Not to mention the fact that Jacksonville's defense is elite. Phillies is damn near that way. And Minnesota's number one. So could you imagine what the Super Bowl we can anticipate for the Super Bowl? It might go down as the most boring Super Bowl in history. Unless Tom Brady's in it. Um, okay, that is certainly a take to have. Yes, it is. That is certainly a take to have. Uh, and there's a couple of things to get in there. Number one, the idea that defenses, um, winning Super Bowls is somehow new and exciting. Stop that now. Yeah. What happened I mean, last year? The Patriots had the uh, best points per game uh, allowed defense in the NFL. What happened the year before? In 2015. Oh, that's right. It was the Denver Broncos, right. number one overall defense that throttled the highest scoring offense in the NFL in Carolina. What happened in Super Bowl 48? Oh, that's right. It was the Legion of Boom Seattle Seahawks defense that took down the highest scoring team in the history of the NFL. What happened in 2000 with the Ravens? What happened in uh, Super Bowl 20 with the Bears? So the idea that defenses win championships is hardly new. So now we get to the other side of the equation of what Stephen A. and others, he's not just him, right. what others are saying. Well, you know, you don't need an elite quarterback to win in the NFL. Stop that now. That is ridiculous. Okay? Let's start with this year's Final Four. Tom Brady, greatest of all time. Yep. Now it's it's uh, Nick Foles. It's not Nick Foles. Carson Wentz was going to be the league's MVP. Yeah, he, was. he was going to be the league's MVP until he got hurt. They're not there because of Nick Foles. They're there because they hung on after Carson Wentz went down. So let's take them out of the equation. Then there's Case Keenum. And you can say whatever you want about Case Keenum prior to 2017, but if you're not looking at Case Keenum in 2017, you're not understanding what you're seeing. Case Keenum, 22 touchdown passes, 7 interceptions, a 98.3 rating, uh, completing 68% of his passes, most of them pushing the ball down the field to Stephon Diggs and Adam Thielen, like he did to win the game Sunday on a 61-yard touchdown throw to Diggs as time expired. So really, if you're upset with the quarterbacks that are in the conference championships, it's about one guy. And that's Blake Bortles. Well, it's exactly right. I mean, when, when you just gave Case Keenum stats, just, you know what it's like? It's like the slam dunk contest. You can see yeah. the exact same slam dunk by a guy you don't know, haven't really heard of and LeBron James. 
And if it's LeBron James, everybody will lose their mind, right? Correct. So Case Keenum, the stats you just gave out, give those stats to one of the top name quarterbacks, and it's going to be like, wow, look at that year. Wow, what a great year. Oh, what a great said. year this yeah. was. But it's Case Keenum, so it's like, well, wait a minute. He's not even, wasn't even a starter. He's a backup, maybe a third stringer, and he's doing this. So I, listen, I'm with you. And, and, and this is an amazing stat. The first time since the 1970 merger, all four teams in the conference championship games have a top five scoring defense. Yeah. During the season. And that's a for, trend we've for, seen for, in recent you years. Know, you know I, I'm, just, I, I'm also tired of hearing what, what else was supposed to be one of the lowest things rated this year? The college football championship and game. And what happened there? And it was the second highest rated. That's so to exactly hear, right. oh, if it's Jacksonville or whoever, it's going to be low. No, it's not. People watch the Super Bowl, whether it's for the pageantry, the commercials, whatever. It's an event. They watch it. They'll be, they'll be close to the, if not as many, then close to as many people that will watch it again. I, I, I get tired of that argument as well. And as far as the argument of, of, of you not needing a, a, um, a franchise, franchise quarterback, quarterback, listen, at the end of the day, if you don't have one, that means you have to be great somewhere else. And, Pretty and, much and, everywhere else. And I just read the stat yeah. where these are all top five scoring defenses. Case of Jacksonville, that is a great defense. Minnesota is a great defense. Philadelphia, to me, is just below, uh, in my mind, a great defense. I think they're a really, really good one. Really good. But I think Jack, if, if you're making me pick, I'm ranking them behind yep. Jacksonville and Minnesota. Right. You could put those wherever you want. One, two, two, one, two, two, one. Then it's Philadelphia. And then to me, it's New England after that. But you better have a great defense. I'll always take a franchise quarterback. Yeah, look. Always say Because you have to get multiple people. I mean, when you're talking about these defenses, you're not talking about one player. You're talking about multiple. You have to hit on multiple positions with multiple players to make up for if you do not have a, a great quarterback. Okay? And if you want to say the other three aren't great quarterbacks, okay. But they're making up for it by other multiple excellent players or great team play as well. But certainly a lot of stars in the league. You have to be able to do that. But give me a franchise quarterback any day of the week, or you better be reading that stat year in and year out. One of the top four or five defenses in the league is now in the conference championship Look, games. For five straight years, the Seahawks had the lowest scoring defense uh, right? In the NFL. And in two of those five years, they went to the Super Bowl and they probably should have won both. They won one. They probably right. should have won both if they just handed off, uh, instead of throwing the interception to Malcolm Butler. By the way, the defense made the play in that Super right. Bowl. They did. And quite frankly, it was the defense that made the play that turned the entire Super Bowl 51 around. Uh, seven and a half minutes to play, 28 to 12. If Dante Hightower doesn't come through with a strip sack fumble of Matt Ryan on third and one, when they should have run the football right. instead of a seven-step step drop, there's no way the Patriots have time to come back. So the idea that this is something new with defenses is absolutely ludicrous. And the idea that you don't need a franchise quarterback is even more ludicrous. Who did we have in the in the conference championship games last year? Do you remember who those four quarterbacks were? Do you remember who those four quarterbacks were in the conference Go championship ahead. games? Okay. You had Matt Ryan. Right. The MVP. MVP. Um, you had Aaron Rodgers. Right? Mm -hmm. uh, you had Tom Brady. Right. Now, who did the Patriots beat in the A's? Oh, Ben Roethlisberger. Ben Roethlisberger. Okay. So those were the four quarterbacks a year See, ago. Th this is something else that happens. Is something else happens for one year, and we're ready to make an edict about it. It's not the so, way it Oh, look at this. Three of the four quarterbacks are not stars, so you don't need them anymore. Yeah. I, 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 that's another thing I really can't stand. This happened this year. Right. Let's see if it happens again next year. And as I said, if you're not going to have that quarterback, you have to have one of the great defenses. And two of these four defenses are like that. Philadelphia is in the area. I really don't put no, – though New England's defense has been playing well toward the end of the year, I don't put them at the level of the other three. And those first two, uh, Minnesota and Jacksonville, are, are playing at a high, high level. Well, let's take it even one step further with Case Keenum. I think if you just looked at his resume and didn't know who the player was that right? had those stats, oh, yeah. you'd be like, man. Well, that's why that's I say exactly it's right. a slam dunk contest. That quarterback's having a hell of a year. Give you an example. All right, Case, I think, only started 14 games this year, correct? I think he only started 14 games this year. Um, he had 22 touchdown passes. Drew Brees, who everybody concedes, is a wonderful Hall of Fame walking in the door first ballot quarterback, right? Yep. He started 16 games. He had 23 touchdown passes. He had 23 touchdown passes and eight interceptions. Case Keenum had 22 and seven. So you're not looking 
at how he's playing. You're looking at your perception yeah, of exactly the guy before this year. You're right. This is this is about Blake Bortles, who has yeah. been really good at times and really bad at times, inconsistent. Case Keenum has had a nice year. Yeah, he has had a really really good year where he is going to have a chance to be a starter next year and make a lot of money for it. Uh, Foles will go back to being a backup because it's Carson Wentz team, so that one will take care of itself. And then Blake Bortles is certainly trying to make the case for himself that said, you know what, you picked up my fifth-year option, that I'm going to be the quarterback of this team going into the future. And then Tom Brady, of course, is Tom Brady. Yeah, exactly. So it's about one guy, and it's about perception, not reality, and how these quarterbacks have played this year. Golick and Wingo, the podcast. It was all sort of one big, giant jello mold. It's very interesting where that went. What isn't gone at this point is the the Warriors' dominance over the Cleveland Cavaliers. They continue to roll. They're ten and two since uh, Christmas, Christmas Day when right. they beat them the first time, and they swept the season series last night, coming from back down seven at the break with a strong second half. Kevin Durant a big part of that. So that's the fourth straight loss for the Cavs. And are there bigger issues with the Cavs than just that loss? Dave McMenamin, ESPN's Cavs reporter, joins us now on the Shell Pennzoil Performance Line. Get the feeling of being rewarded with gold status at Shell with the Fuel Rewards program. Download the Fuel Rewards app, join, and start saving five cents a gallon today. Uh, Dave, let's talk about the story you have out there that it looks like there are some cracks in the foundation on the championship foundation, and some of the Cavs are now beginning to openly wonder if they can fix their problems. Absolutely. Able to fix their problems without some sort of major shakeup with this roster. And, you know, we're talking just a few short weeks ago, this team was coming off 18 wins out of 19 tries and seemed to have things figured out. But it was a bit of fool's gold because they were playing with a roster that wasn't complete. Uh, They were not using two of their primary pieces that need to get playing time as this team is currently constructed. And Isaiah Thomas and Tristan Thompson, and they've been a mess lately. And, it, it, you know, you could always try to play the effort card or you could try to play the coaching card, uh, but that's not the sentiment that was reverberating in the Cavs locker room last night. It was, look at what we've done the last couple of years. We did a roster change in trade in 2015 to get J.R. Smith, Iman Shepard, and uh, Timofey Mozgov. 2016, uh, we traded away Anderson Varejao and got Channing Fry. And, and in 2017, we got Kyle Korver. Uh, there is a, a sense that a type of deal of that magnitude needs to occur again for them to get back on a championship trajectory. Uh, and right now, there's a bit of a standoff between the players and the Cavs front office because uh, by all indications, the Brooklyn Nets first round pick the Cavs have in their possession, the front office does not want to part with uh, and hold on to it as sort of a insurance policy should LeBron James part uh, in the summer of 2018 as a free agent. So uh, it seems like, Dave, that, that every year around this time we're talking about something on why the Cavs won't be able to do with it. We think they're going to do it at the end of the year, and then at the end of the year they end up in the championships. But is it, and you've been there every step of the way. So does it seem more like this year that there are more realistic reasons why they may not be able to get to the finals in the other years? I think one of the huge reasons there, Mike, is that those teams had LeBron James, Kevin Love, and Kyrie Irving. And this team has LeBron James, Kevin Love, and their third best player coming off seven and a half months not playing because of a major, major hip injury. And maybe Isaiah Thomas returns to the all-star form. And, and I think a lot of players are rooting for him to do so. But there's doubt about whether that's going to be a feasible scenario to occur in such a short time frame. And, and that is a pressure factor here. And, you know, Isaiah's only played five games so far. So everybody, the front office and the, the coaching staff and the players, they need more time and Isaiah needs more time to show what he can do. There's not a lot of time to be had, though. It's January 16th. The trade deadline is February 8th. Uh, Isaiah said over the weekend that he probably needs 15 to 20 games, perhaps a month, before he feels like he'll be able to show the type of player he is. Well, you know, if you give that long of an evaluation period, the trade deadline's already passed. And so there's a sense of urgency right now that, that something needs to be done regardless of that that 
you know, kind of wait and see period with Isaiah Thomas. Dave McMenamin, our Cavs reporter, joins us on Golic and Wingo right now. So, look, we sort of went through this once already this season, uh, Dave, with the Cavs at the start of the season. They, they won that opening game against the Celtics and then sort of went through that uh, slide before they got into that uh, streak of winning 18 of 19. Is there any sense, and that was sort of because they were trying to mesh those parts together, uh, a new unit. Do, do we think that any part of this might be related to the fact that they're trying to work Isaiah Thomas in now, and once they get him figured out, they'll turn this thing around again? I mean, there there is a little bit of that hope there. Um, it, it, it's not impossible to think that could occur. Uh, but, you know, even Isaiah Thomas at his very best uh, presents defensive problems. Um, and, uh, you know, that's the Cavs' biggest deficiency right now. The 29th in the league in defensive um, rating. No team in NBA history that's finished in the, the bottom two in the league in defensive rating has made the playoff, let alone made the NBA final. And so uh, they need to be shored up in that category, uh, irregardless of how well Isaiah Thomas returns to form. And, and again, this, this is a group that, you know, from their playoff experience, recognizes what a, a finals team looks like, recognizes what a playoff team looks like, recognizes what a play- championship team looks like. And when they look around at their personnel, uh, you know, several prominent players uh, told ESPN and, and several other outlets last night that, they don't have the group currently uh, that, that's made up of what it would take to get back to the NBA Finals and win a championship. All right, David, let's do what we can do because we're not part of the organization. We can make a trade. Uh, if, <laughs> and if, in your mind, if they do pull off some kind of a move, what type of player, like position-wise and or who, would that be? They need players that will be able to play both sides of the ball and are multifaceted, but not, not players who are specialists, not players uh, who, uh, you know, I know there's some clamoring out there uh, because DeAndre Jordan's name has been in the trade machine uh, seemingly since the first week of the season because he potentially could be a free agent this summer and the Clippers may want to move on from his contract. Uh, but that's not necessarily the type of player that, that the Cavs believe can get them to where they want to get to. Uh, you got to think more of uh, two-way players, and two-way players are valuable in the league right now. And it would take something major to pry a, a two-way player from uh, you know a team that's out there that's, that's certainly in contention. But you know, uh, I, a guy that's been mentioned um, I'm not by the players I spoke to, but by people around the league is someone like Tyreek Evans in Memphis. Um, someone like Kent Bazemore in Atlanta. I mean, those are the guys. Those are guys who can play both sides of the basketball. Uh, problem with Bazemore is that he has a major, major contract uh, right now, you know, making upwards of sixteen, seventeen million dollars a year, and that would be a huge financial burden for the guys to take on if they couldn't send out salary. And uh, someone like Tyreek Evans has never been quite known for his defense, but certainly has the you know the body and, and the potential skill set to provide that. But it, it could be you know, teaching a player new habits on the fly, and that could be its own set of, of problems added to the mix of the problems they already have. So uh, there, there's no magic bullet solution out there. Um, I would say that in 2016, anyone thought that Chang Fry was the perfect fit, but he was an additional piece that helped them win games. And the team felt that they got – Reserves. They got help on the way, and it, and it boosted morale. And that's also part of uh, what's going on here. There's a lack of confidence in the players in what the front office uh, has done thus far or potentially is capable of doing because it's unproven front office. They fired or they parted ways with David Griffin back in June uh, the GM, Kobe Altman, is the second youngest GM in the league right now. And, and I mean, he's fresh on the job. Uh, I think he's a, a savvy, a smart, prepared guy. But until he proves it, that he can pull off a deal like this in this league, uh, he's yet to do it. And uh, that's part of what's at play here, too. Uh, Dave McManaman with us. Uh, Dave, real quickly, before we let you go, one, after one of those losses, I can't remember which one of the last four, uh, Ty Lue got up there and said, if there are agendas, we need to get rid of those agendas. Do we have any idea about what agendas he was alluding to? 
yeah, I mean, I, I, I followed back with Ty, and he swears that it wasn't meant to shed light on anything other than the fact that the way they were playing defensively, it was selfish, where players were more concentrated on the optics of getting scored on by a man rather than making the right defensive uh, adjustments or rotations and picking up a player if their teammate was burned by a guy um, and having those habits be intrinsically um, part of what they do no matter who scores because Ty, Ty followed up on those comments to say it's not that this guy is your man or my man, it's our team's man. And until we approach our defense that way, we're going to struggle. And um, again, I mean, if you want to point to anything that's going on with this team, as I mentioned before, the defense is atrocious. And and that takes a certain degree of trust for everyone involved to want to put yourself out there uh, to help a teammate. Well, it's certainly the want to. Sometimes you have to wonder again those back to back games where they lost by twenty five points right. and no one's made it to won a championship or even made it to the finals. I think that year with that stat. So we'll see what happens, Dave. We appreciate it. Thanks so much. Thanks, Dave. Thanks, guys. Golik and Wingo, the podcast. Let's not expect too much. There's only one person out there that's expecting way too much out of this guy too early. We know who that is. It's his father. Pete Bursich joins us now on Golik and Wingo. Pete, thanks for being with us. How are you this morning? Ah, I'm doing great. Just another minus 20 day up here in Minnesota. Gotta love it. We are, oh my we are looking forward to that in a, in a couple of weeks. Wow. We're getting excited. Uh, not as excited, uh, though, as you were, Pete. Yes. Uh, during the end of the game Sunday, uh, the call, for those that didn't hear it, and we played it a bunch uh, on this uh uh, on this uh, on this show, but we're going to play it for everybody one more time. This was you and Paul Allen calling the game-winning touchdown to Case Keenum to Stephon Diggs. Three receivers right, field and left. Marshawn Lattimore, 12 yards from Adam. Case on a deep drop, steps up in the pocket. He'll fire to the right side, caught by Diggs. Stay oh, my God, oh, my God! Oh, my God! Now, let, to be fair, yes. the first thing he said was analytical. Stay in Stay bounds. In bounds. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, Pete, first and foremost, take us through that moment. Obviously, we all watched it. I was ready to go and do NFL primetime with Ryan Clark and Jeff Saturday and Tim Hasselback and talk about how the Vikings defense let them down, and everything changed in the final 10 seconds of that game. What was it like calling that as it was happening? Well, that I mean, that's exactly it. I mean, you're... You have to understand the history up here. I mean, like I, I mean, I played uh, for seven years. I was on the field in '98 when we lost the Falcons in 15 and one, and then in 2000 when we lost 41 to nothing. Uh, I called the game in 2009 when we had 12 men in the huddle and blew it down in New Orleans. We missed a 17, was a 24 yard or whatever it was field goal Blair against Walsh, yeah. Seattle. Um, I was coaching. I was in the booth coaching. Uh, in 2003 when the Arizona Cardinals score in the last play of the game and knock us out of the playoffs. I mean, it, it's 23 years of seeing things go the wrong way. And toward the end of that drive, I was, I mean, I, what I was thinking about was how do you sum this season up in about 30 seconds? Cause that's about all you get at the end of the game. You know, like, what do you say? What do you, you know, what do you, how do you sum this year up with the ups and the downs and, and everything else? And then that happened. And that's kind of how it, you know, it just, that's about that's what faith is, I guess. I mean, you talk about being pushed to the precipice of just giving up. And fans up here, trust me, after four Super Bowl losses and everything else, uh, to finally be on that side of the coin, it just yeah, that's how good it felt. That's exactly what it sounds like when you're when you finally win one that way. Pete, from a ball player's perspective, you know, we had Kyle Rudolph on yesterday, and I'm wondering for you, if you're watching that and one of his teammates, because you're, you were a defensive player, so you, you would have been on the sideline. I'm wondering before you made the comment, stay in bounds, as a ball player, were you thinking, because Kyle Rudolph said he was, get out of bounds. As soon as he caught it, he was thinking, get your butt out of bounds right now. Well, yeah, I mean, that's, they ran, see, what happened was this, they ran that play about two or three times in that right, series. Right. And, Williams, the safety, he saw that play. They knew it was coming, and I think he just got there too soon. 
And when he gets there too soon, you either you have to make a split-second decision of whether or not you're going to make a play on the ball. And if you make a play on the ball, you could miss it, and that could happen. And then he just decided to avoid contact to eliminate the penalty. And that's why I yelled, stay in bounds, because there was, there was nobody left. And if he just turned and, and turned and stays in bounds and goes upfield, then boom, it's a touchdown. So, uh, he, and Diggs even said the same thing. He said he knew he only had one safety above him. He went up and caught the ball. He saw that body fly by. So he decided to stay in bounds and turn and go. And I don't know. I think about Brian Robinson, who's been with us for a very, very long time, about 10 or 11 seasons. And I'm sure he's sitting there on the bench watching this going, this is it. I'm done. Cause he's probably going to retire after this wow. season. And then, all of a sudden, after that, you know, you look up and you're like, I have one more game. I'm one game away from the Super Bowl. So you talk about a, a complete 180 in the course of seven seconds. It's, it's unbelievable. But that's, that's the NFL, and that's what we love. It's the drama. No, no question about it. We had that in spades uh, this past weekend. Pete Bursich from KFAN, former Vikings player and coach, now does the color commentary with Paul Allen on KFAN. When we had Kyle on... He said the play call in the huddle was heaven. Did you guys know that was the play call? They told us that after the game. It was like seventh, you know, seventh heaven, a bunch of seven routes, you know, three levels out to the flat. And, uh, you know, no, we, we, we didn't know that going into it. But after the game, when we were interviewing players on the sidelines, you know, they, uh, that's what they, that's, they brought that up and said that's the name of the play. And it's just one more thing to make it just kind of a cool moment oh, in time, crazy. cool moment in history to be a part of. Have you ever from, you know, Notre Dame, I know you got there after the 88 title, I believe, because I think you graduated in 94. So I don't know if any of your years there or in the NFL match any kind of a win that, that begins in this area at all? No, I, I don't think so. I mean, that's the first walk-off playoff win in the history of the NFL. So, no, I mean, I, I we had a couple of great ones. I mean, I've been a part of a lot of big comebacks in 97. We came back and beat the Giants in a playoff game and, uh, we were down by, I think, three scores with about 10 minutes or, you know, left to go. Some, some crazy. So I've been a part of a couple of them, but never, never anything like that when you're absolutely convinced yourself that's it. You know, it's over and then boom, something like that happens. So, uh, no, nothing like that. Well, again, you're right. We've never seen anything like that. That was the first time in a playoff game in NFL history. We had a touchdown in the fourth quarter with no time left on the clock. Pete Persich with, Bursich with us. Uh, who does the color commentary in the Vikings radio network. Paul Allen is the play-by-play guy. And obviously, you, you, if you we've played the call, and yeah. I'm sure people have heard it a million times, you, you, just, you just went nuts, which was awesome. But I'm just curious, at any point after that, did Paul come to you and say, dude, you rained my moment? I mean, I, I, this, this was going to be my, but do you believe my in Al miracles? Michael's call. Yes, this is, yeah, yeah this is, uh, you know, and they won't, you know, uh, I don't believe what I just saw. Did he ever say, bro, you, you killed me there? No, he hasn't. He's been, you know, it, it, that was, um, no, I mean, I get, I get, uh, I get teased all the time for stepping on touchdown calls and things like that. So you try to, you try to stay away from it, but, uh, I could, I couldn't help myself on that one. I mean, that was just, uh, I mean, what are you going to do? I, I he, yeah. it, the way he carried it and the, the, the amazing part is that being a part of that and, and listening and watching PA and those guys do their work to know that it was an exactly a 61 yard play you know, with the spotter that was in there. He just happened to check the weather forecast for Philadelphia for the following Sunday and knew that it was going to be 48 and drizzly. That's what it said in the paper. And, you know, and to be able to, to, to draw from all that in the middle of all that emotion, it's, it's pretty – it's, it's tough to do. It's not an easy thing to do, and he does a great job doing it. Yeah, he does. And, and again, looking quickly ahead, yeah, it's, out, it's up to 51 now, Pete. Just so it's you know. Beautiful. Yeah. 50 and partly cloudy may get some drizzle. So let's give us a quick thought, right? As, as I'm sure already, as you, you've come down from this thing and get ready for the next game, a quick synopsis you think of the, of this matchup for the Vikings against this Eagles team. Well, I think the best, the most uh, important of weapon that we're going to bring is Kai Forbath. I mean, you got two two solid defenses. Philly's very very good up front. You've got uh, you know two quarterbacks that uh, if you'd have said we're going to meet in the NFC Championship game on September 11th, everybody would have laughed at you. Best prop bet uh, ever. So it, it's going to be a 15 to nine, 12 to nine, I think type game. This is it's going to be low. It's going to be low scoring, old school field position. Uh, you know, that kind of a game, and uh, I can't wait. It's, it's going to be just the opportunity to be one game away from the Super Bowl and have that in your hometown. I mean, that's something not, not, it's never happened before. 
Uh, so hopefully it'll be a, a, a season of firsts and uh, the Vikings can get to get by um, you know Philadelphia this Sunday afternoon or Sunday evening. Well, you'll see a lot of dog masks out there yeah, uh, you in will. Philadelphia. <laughs> they are loving the fact that they are an underdog uh, one more time as the number one seed. Pete, we appreciate you being with us. Uh, thanks for playing along. And I can't wait to hear what happens if it's another game-winning <laughs> deciding play in the NFC Championship game that sends you guys to the Super Bowl. Best of luck this weekend, Pete. Thanks, All right, Pete. I'll, hey, Golick, I'll bite, I'll bite my lip this time and won't step on anything, and I'll be, not, I'll be good and quiet. No, dude, no, hell dude. no. I would be stepping all over him as well. You just do your thing. That was awesome. Be you, Pete. Be <laughs> you. All right, guys. Thank you. This has been the Best of Golick and Wingo podcast. Make sure to subscribe on the ESPN app, Apple Podcasts, and to listen every weekday morning at 6 Eastern on ESPN Radio, ESPN2, and the ESPN app. Attention shoppers, clean up on aisle 14. Clean up on aisle 14. Someone dropped a jar of pickles. 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 Beatboxing at a big box store. Surprising. What's not surprising? How much you could save by switching to Geico. A red minivan has the lights on in the parking lot. Geico. 15 minutes could save you 15% or more. Geico. Geico.